Thank you for coming. But first, I want to know how many of you are here because you couldn't get into the Jerry Brown thing and are really inclined to be miffed at us. No, okay, good. See, that's a good start. <laughs> Dick's, Dick's going to leave in a minute. Does he have a house or does he uh, is that, is that what is that, is he homeless? Well, Dick, you're always inclined to help the homeless, so here's your opportunity. You know the former mayor of Los Angeles here, Dick Reardon, who's in the front row heckling us already, so. We'll talk about that later. So you and I are supposed to talk about stories of our misspent journalism youth. You first. Uh, that was never my understanding. Oh, okay. This is a mystery session. Uh, we don't know exactly why we're here, but we're flattered that you are here. And from my point of view, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time interviewing Pat Morrison about a very distinguished career in Los Angeles and California, and drawing from that uh, insight into the, um, into the plight of uh, journalism today. And uh, I may occasionally throw in opinions of my own, but as they happen in my own household, they don't necessarily carry a great deal of credibility. Um, I, l let me go to the very beginning. I know you mainly as a, a columnist for the LA Times. And a couple years ago, uh, in a casual conversation, she told me that she traveled in a car and in the car she had dog food, water, and cups that she would put to work anytime she saw uh, an animal that was obviously lost and in peril. And I was so impressed by that. I'm not that big of a dog person, though I've always had them. And that I went out with my wife one time, we were coming down from Santa Barbara, and I was taking two lane roads, and we saw in an old abandoned, looked like it was a bank building, a small dog. And the dog was just sitting on the, on the porch of this building and was obviously one of the loneliest creatures I ever saw. And I, we both looked at one another and both of us said simultaneously, Pat Morrison. And we drove to a 7-Eleven, got dog food, got water, got a great plastic bowl and then a second smaller bowl and went back to the dog. And it's because of her, I did something that was totally out of step for me and perhaps did some animal in plight uh, some good. Where were you born and how did you ever become a journalist? Well, first of all, that's one of the most touching accolades I think I've ever had. Thank you, well, Stan. Um, I think you've probably motivated more people than you know to emulate your generosity. But go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, like so many people in California, uh, I came from Ohio, and uh, Doug Brinkley, among others, in present company. And um, this was not even legally a town. It was a village of 1,200 people. And it had no bookstore. It had no movie theater. It had six churches for 1,200 people, two cemeteries full of many of my relatives, some of them not soon enough. Um, and the library was the saving of anybody who had curiosity beyond what the local boundaries and the local school could offer. And yet twice a year, a bookmobile came to town to sell books and laid out books in the gym of the junior high school. And I was allowed to buy two books. My father climbed electric poles. There wasn't a lot of money. The farm didn't bring in a lot of money either. And so you can imagine with only two books, I did what we would all do, which is walk through very slowly and read as fast as I could and put something back, try it again with the next book. But then I saw a book on whose cover was a, a painting, a, an illustration of a woman in a 19th century dress with leg of mutton sleeves and her hair piled up and a notebook in her hand and suitcases at her feet. And I thought, what is this? And it turned out to be a juvenile biography of Nellie Bly. 
was a pioneering journalist in the 19th century when women were not allowed to vote yet, could not own property, had no right to the custody of their own children. And yet here's a woman who exposed corruption in Tammany Hall and in upstate New York, who wrote about the abuses of immigrants, the mistreatment of animals, the mistreatment of children. And I thought, I really think I'd like to do that job at a time when the only newspaper I saw was the little weekly paper in that little town and then the Sunday paper from the big city of Columbus, Ohio. And so being fortunate at the age of eight to know what I wanted to do when there's still people in their 20s trying to figure it out, I consider myself lucky to have gotten a head start and I still have that little book. So it's not in great shape. I think my brother put a mustache on Nellie Bly, but she's none the worse for wear. Did you, did you go to college and study journalism? Uh, I didn't think and in many ways still don't think there's a point in getting a journalism degree because you're not going to inter interview people about the history of the linotype machine. You're going to interview people about their lives, their experiences, some of which are so far varied from what your own life can imagine that that's what you need to study. You need to study history, politics, economics, language, science, because as a daily reporter, you're thrown into the mix every day and have but to- But in a practical sense, how did you get from a little village in Ohio into a journalism job in the beginning of a career? Well, for starters, there were no security guards at the LA Times then. I think had that been the case, the Fuller Brush man and I both would have been out on our ears. Um, I went to Occidental College. I'm the first person in my family to go to college. And my family was very supportive, although they couldn't give me really any money. But Occidental gave me more, more, more money than any place else I had applied to. And it was in Los Angeles, which means I wouldn't have to buy sweaters had I gone to Yale. Um, and there was a big newspaper there, the Los Angeles Times. And I thought this was a place that perhaps I could wind up working. I didn't think that I would be working there before I was old enough to drink. But um, studied all those things that I mentioned to you. And then with a little packet of clippings that I had uh, acquired, put together, um, walked into the paper one day and asked to see the city editor. I knew enough not to ask for the editor. And uh, essentially volunteered in exchange for class credit, even though there was no journalism program at Occidental College. And the newsroom was virtually empty of women. It, they had no people who spoke Spanish, even though I'm not Latino, I speak Spanish. And they said, sure kid, Who's gonna turn down free labor, right? And so that's where I was from the time I was, I think, 19 years old. Who was your champion? Who was the person who, who, who professionally embraced you? The Morning City editor was a man named Jack Goulding who fit the profile of the cigar chewing, um, smoke puffing, skeptical editor who looks askance over his glasses at every reporter and every piece of copy brought to him. But it turns out he had a daughter about my age who herself went into journalism. And I think he had a soft spot for me because of that. And there were also very kind people in the newsroom who taught me the ropes, having been thrown into the deep end, taught me how to do things, taught me how you end up writing this kind of story versus that kind of story. One of them was the correspondent, Dial Torgerson, who ended up getting killed in Central America covering the conflicts there. But I will always be grateful to him for shepherding me through a lot of this. It's worth noting that the first real professional editor of the LA Times was a man from Ohio by the name of Loomis, who was hired by... General Otis. And the man walked from Cincinnati, Ohio to Los Angeles to take the job. And he did voluminous notes as he progressed across our nation and uh, he ended up being the most sophisticated and uh, energetic collector of Native American arts and crafts. And a lot of the stuff he put together is now part of the Autry Museum. What Which, was your first big story? Ah. Uh. He also founded the Southwest Museum, which is where these artifacts originally were posed. I'm, I remember the first story I did. The, the first big story was probably being sent to cover a hurricane in Mexico, again, because of Spanish-speaking skills. Nobody bothered then about liability. The fact that I wasn't a formal employee did not enter into it. 
although had my body been cast up on the beach at the end of the hurricane, something might have been said by my family. But at that time, we ran a page called Southland Briefs, where the first three or four words of it had to be in boldface type to be catchy. And so I was given an assignment to write this particular story in two or three sentences. And the first three words cast in boldface type were a cut rate crematorium. And when I turned that in to Mr. Goulding, he nodded and he said, good, which was the equivalent of a Pulitzer Prize in that newsroom for a kid. Were the men alarmed, annoyed, impatient with your presence? Yes, all of those. Um, there were some who didn't think that women had any business in the newsroom. There were a couple of women working there at the time and uh, still had had to scrap their way into it. There were some who were very generous spirited. There were some who were importunate. And there were some who were, as often happens, some of the best feminists are the fathers of daughters who find with their daughters that their daughters are being thwarted in their career paths because they're female. They're not getting paid as much because they're female. And as a consequence, there were men who were very helpful, very protective in a lot of ways. Uh, one fellow called me a toothsome ginger snap, very tongue in cheek. <laughs> and the phrase was so lovely. You know, how could I reproach anybody like that? Um, we had a photographer who had been at the paper quite a long time, had taken pictures of the Black Dahlia during that notorious murder, the body in situ there on, uh, in South LA. And his idea of hazing was to lay out his pictures of the Black Dahlia on a table back in photo, and then invite the new kid, in this case me, to come back to gauge the reaction. Well, I had been warned that this was going to be happening, so I took a deep breath and walked in and walked around the table and finally looked up at him and said, interesting composition, and walked out and went to the bathroom preparing to upchuck. Thankfully, I did not. <laughs> the what was your first big story of consequence that established you as a truly credible journalist? I think at the times it was the fact that because I was also going to classes, I was coming into the paper at six in the morning for writing for what was called the late final, when you remember afternoon editions that carried the final stock report and businessmen would buy that to know what the last uh, stock figures were. I'd been sent out to LAX because there had been, I think I'm a little hazy on this, but there had been a body found in a piece of checked luggage. And the luggage had come from Iran. And the story, as often happens, unfolded. Is it a murder victim? Whose body is it? What's the body doing there? And the police then started following the trail of the owner of the suitcase, the man who had checked the suitcase through to LAX. And he was found, again, I'm a little hazy, I'm trying to remember, dead in his apartment at UCLA. He was Iranian. He'd gone back to Iran to marry the bride that he wanted to marry. It was also the bride of his family's choosing. And then found out she could not get a visa into the United States. So they'd hatched a plan where she would be put in a suitcase. She had water. I remember she had bananas. They put bananas in there. And he would check her through to Los Angeles. And like Romeo and Juliet, both awakening at the same time in the tomb, he would unzip the suitcase, and there she would be. Very cold, but none the worse for wear. And of course, it didn't happen that way, because very often, certainly then, the compartments, the baggage compartments, were um, not acclimatized. And she presumably died of, of anoxia at that altitude or cold. And then seeing her body there, he had gone home and killed himself. And to write that, that story doesn't need elaboration. That story doesn't need embroidery. You know, so often people overwrite stories that don't need overwriting. You just tell the facts of that story and you're going to get choked up. The reporter shouldn't interfere like that. Just let the story tell itself. It was so good, so moving, so heartbreaking as it was. And I think that was a big front page story for the late afternoon file. I think it stayed, stayed on the front page throughout the next day's edition, which was a big deal. Um, so there were several stories like that that showed that I could be trusted with big news and big stories. When did you start writing a column? And what was the premise of the column? Well, 
we had had at the Los Angeles Times no women columnists since I think the Korean War. Uh, we had had uh, a woman named Flora Bell Muir writing for a while, a, a law enforcement column. She was married to a sheriff's deputy and her claim to notoriety was that she'd been at a nightclub with Bugsy Siegel and got shot in the butt uh, when Bugsy Siegel was not mortally wounded. That came later. Um, but I wanted to learn about Los Angeles. Everybody thinks you go into the newspaper business to be a foreign correspondent, to be a Washington correspondent. To me, Los Angeles was terra incognita coming from Ohio. It was terra incognita for the thousands of people who moved there every year. And so I thought it was important to tell the stories of Los Angeles and to explain our own city to ourselves. As long ago as the 1920s, Dorothy Parker had talked about Los Angeles as 60 suburbs in search of a city. Now we're 88 suburbs in search of a city. And each of those had a personality and a character that was distinct from what the actual city of Los Angeles was <coughs> and why it was a city unto itself. And so when I finally <coughs> approached our editors saying that I thought we needed a metro column that would explain Los Angeles and Southern California from the point of view in a way of someone who was a stranger there, who was ex exploring and finding this place anew every day as some of us still do with Los Angeles, whether it was its politics, whether it was the social cultural phenomena, or even as in the case of big breaking stories like O.J. Simpson, telling something that I thought readers needed to hear and learn beyond the news coverage. And a column, you know, the last person you're writing about in a newspaper is yourself. This is not what the readers are buying the newspaper to find out. So even with a column, you're using yourself as a filter, as a means of a springboard to tell a story, a parable, an example for, um, for one, like even the story of taking food to the, the dogs, which I did the days after the riots. I went through riot-stricken Los Angeles writing stories, but also leaving out dog food and water for the dogs who I knew had been terrified and run away from home. So telling, using myself as a way to tell stories I thought was an important mechanism at a time when people wanted to be Washington columnists or to be foreign correspondents. I was perfectly content to tell Los Angeles stories. I think you did a marvelous column, and then I enjoyed, not that many years ago, where you would interview every week a person of consequence in the city, the state, the country. Um, who was your best interviewer? Oof, that's a question we all get, and it's hard to play favorites. Um, at the same time, I was doing some of my columns, I was also doing a television show on our PBS station in Los Angeles, and then later did a seven, for seven years, a live uh, radio talk show. And so each of those media, as you know, as a television person, gives you a different opportunity to perhaps tell the, t the same story in a different way and bring a different sensibility to each story. Gosh, and as far as some of the most interesting characters, um, Ooh, I, I like interviewing scientists. It's not my metier, and so I like how scientists are able to make sense of the world. One of them is here today, Lucy Jones, the seismologist whom we knew from Caltech, the seismom we called her for, for years. But to make that part of the world make sense. Talking to Dick Reardon, for example, about his library, Dick and I became fast friends. You think of Dick as a politician, but Dick has one of the most stupendous private libraries in, in the city of Los Angeles. And so Dick's affection for books and his stories about books, uh, I think took a different aspect of our mayor to the readers of the Los Angeles Times, to the city. Another story I love doing, it was a feature story and not a column, one of the last big interviews of Barry Goldwater, um, who had written a book of his memoirs and who died not long after. I spent a couple of days in Scottsdale with him. And what a massive figure on the American landscape and how his anger was directed toward how Republican politics had shifted away from pure conservatism to religious conservatism, to social conservatism, which he was very unhappy about. <coughs> um, but to see this man and his setting and write about the place he came from, the life he had lived before he became a political figure and a national one, I thought again was important at a moment when 
conservatism was being redefined in the 90s in the Reagan era as, era as we see it being redefined or attempting to be redefined now. I can recall g g gaining great respect for uh, Goldwater when I learned that he would come home from his long, exhausting political trips and he'd put his water, his air bottles on his back, that stuff they use when they go underwater. The scuba. Scuba. And he would jump into his pool and sit at the bottom of the pool for an hour to decompress. <laughs> I always thought, wow, what an interesting man. That what a switch from Washington now. There, you're there, keep going. So, um, actually, one of the, the, the consistent ongoing stories I've liked it, um, writing is about the royal family, whom I've covered for the LA Times, from the funeral of the Princess of Wales to, um, uh, to covering Prince Philip and I've been on the yacht more than, Royal Yacht more than Cape Middleton, which is a bit of a cheat when I say that because they retired the Royal Yacht before Cape Middleton uh, joined the Royal Family. But I was one of those people you may have read about who was spray painted by Prince Andrew, who had been, come to Los Angeles, was very unhappy about the coverage he'd gotten in the tabloids about his girlfriend, but he was there to be a goodwill ambassador and went with Kenneth Hahn, the supervisor, to a housing project in Watts Willowbrook, which was being built. And uh, the people who were covering this good deed visit were not the tabloids. It was Reuters. It was the Associated Press. It was you know, <coughs> the BBC. And yet, of course, he didn't differentiate among us, saw a, a spray paint gun lying at his feet, picked it up, said to Kenny Hahn, watch this, and hosed us down with white paint, put it down, wiped his hands on a newspaper, fittingly, and said, I enjoyed that. He never did apologize, although his mother paid the bills for all the damage that he did. I have my beautiful red hat covered with white paint, which I'm going to leave to the Daughters of the American Revolution as a little, you know, little reminder. Um, but several years later, when he married uh, Sarah Ferguson, I was invited to join them on the Royal Yacht. And that was a sort of sorry but not sorry gesture. And then we were we sailed out aboard an aircraft carrier whose name I can't remember, uh, again, as part of a goodwill exercise. And Prince Andrew, of course, was a helicopter pilot, and he flew us in a Chinook back from the aircraft carrier to the mainland. And all I could think of is if that crashed, my name would be in the 17th paragraph in very small type because we knew what the headline would be, and I would write it that way too, in all fairness. The first time I had been on the Royal Yacht was when the Queen came to California and went to see the Reagans at their ranch. And uh, the plan was that the Queen would stay aboard the yacht and then come to the shore to do her events. But the weather was so bad that they had to stay in, uh, had to stay in town um, and stay with the Reagans and stay at the St. Francis Hotel, which was a great treat for the Queen because she usually doesn't get to do things like go to Trader Vic's and stay in hotels. So I, of course, called my mother and said, guess who's under the same roof I am at the St. Francis Hotel? It was the only story where I'd ever overslept and missed the call. The call was for the press bus to follow the Queen out to Yosemite. But that one time I got a break because the Secret Service detail advancing the Queen's trip to Yosemite had gone around a curve on a road and been hit head-on by another car. And three Secret Service agents were killed. This was in the age before cell phones so all of my press colleagues were on a bus that had no way of finding out anything or calling their offices. And so I was able to stay in the hotel and do all the reporting on this. So by the time they got back, I was trying to help brief them in a story that I'd already beaten them on. So I guess I had it both ways under those circumstances. My mother um, sold hats um, at some of the major stores in America. And Princess Schiaparelli, I think, was her Ooh. favorite uh, millinery design. So I've always been somewhat curious about hats. What is it with you and hats? <laughs> well, I have to say one of the great um, advantages is having a hat pin. And uh, there have been occasions when I've had to at least threaten to use it. But what so I like is... what the hat pin is that women supposedly... Well, the hat pin keeps the hat on your head because you stick it into the hat under your hair, along your scalp, and then back out it again. It sounds terrifying. Well, it's terrifying to watch because I see the drink, faces of really people. It's really terrifying. 
You see the faces of people when you put your hat pin back in and they just look a little green and queasy. Well, and why are you wearing hats? I, actually, I have a birth defect called Sturge-Weber syndrome. And I have, you know, it's, it's affected my skin. It's also affected my scalp. So my mother put me in hats very young uh, to protect both. And far from being uh, a handicap, I think it's become something of an asset. I never fail to get called on at press conferences. And in this part of the world, you carry your own shade with you. And we all know how important that is, right? I think, it's, I think the hats are fantastic. Thank you. It's given you a real shtick. And uh, when you're looking out of a room full of people, seeing that hat, <laughs> you know, that's somebody you can, one, trust, or that's somebody you think is going to ask an intelligent question. And I think it's great. Well, How many I'm hats do you have? Well, generally not enough. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, I probably have about 300. And how, how do you... How do you, do you have a different uh, house for your hats? <laughs> I mean, oh, I wish. How do you it's, handle all those hats? It's probably the most organized part of the wardrobe because there's a box for red straws and red felts and blue straws and blue felts and, and so on. I have some antique hats which are too old and fragile When did to you wear, last buy a hat? I try to buy them when I travel. So if I'm out of town, you're I out have of a town. Are you going to buy a hat here of all places? I have to admit I haven't seen anything yet to entice me in Rancho Mirage, which is not to say that there isn't something. What did your out hat there. cost? Um, this hat? Yeah. Ballpark. Thirty dollars. That's not bad. No. Most expensive hat cost what? Well, if you go to London and spend, you know, the what did you crazy do in money, London? I think the most expensive hat I ever got was a maker in London. It was probably two hundred dollars, but okay. it was London. Money. Okay, enough of that diversion. Um, a few days ago, the uh, the Gannett organization announced it was laying off four hundred journalists throughout its system. And it, it, it is the most recent, but one of the most sizable uh, cutbacks in the journalistic staff for a major organization. How did you handle personally the series, un the unrelenting series of cutbacks in the LA Times and the deterioration of its quality that resulted? It was obviously demoralizing, but what was more demoralizing was that all of these changes came from a leadership that was not invested in journalism, that didn't know anything about Los Angeles to speak of, and for whom these cuts were just another opportunity to increase their winnings, their take home. Um, whatever the demands of the market, whatever the demands of journalism, and I have something to say certainly about the nature of journalism and anti-journalism and non-journalism. Um, these were calculations that I think had to do as much with their own corporate pockets as it did with anything to do with the, the economics of journalism. These are people who enrich themselves regularly um, beyond what anybody, anybody would countenance as fair or honest. Um, uh, an honest day's wage in that sense um, to, to the people they were supervising and whom they employed. My newspaper, the LA, the LA Times, kept arriving at my house every day. It got thinner. Um, it, it was a bit dirty. Why should I care? I got the news. Where what, did, what's the problem here? Where did you get the news? From the LA Times. It came to my house every morning. Oh, I see. Why should I, as a consumer, be concerned about this? Because as you read the LA Times and as a reader, you would ask questions like, well, what about what's happening in X place? What is the news I am not getting here? And we had to cut back coverage of city government, of county government. You know, if you want to know what's happening where you live, you may not have been able to see it because we were in retreat from covering some of those things. We did not cover, uh, for example, California in the nation's capital as well as we should have. We had the biggest congr congressional delegation in the country. There were more stories there that were going uncovered. The Sacramento Bureau 
which is where, as you know, so much public policy and so many laws that govern you and your life come out of, we didn't have enough people there. We couldn't field the team we needed to to do the, the job we as journalists thought that we should do. And that's very hard. It's hard to go to work every day and know that you should be writing, covering three stories when you can only manage one, that you should have three reporters on this story where you can only manage one. Um, and for someone who believes in why we have a First Amendment, that an informed citizenry is vital to democracy, vital. You know, this is the reason that postage rates are cheaper for publications. That goes back to Ben Franklin, because they said, we need people to be able to send newspapers and magazines, periodicals out and afford to do it and to get it to people in an affordable fashion so they know what's going on in their government. And it's just, it's heartbreaking and it was demoralizing to come into work and to, for a veteran staffer like me to try to buoy the spirits of people who were there to try to help along the newer people. It, it, was, it was soul crushing. And I think you find these stories at virtually every newspaper in America, and Gannett is no now no exception. What is your prognosis for the paper as it now stands? Oh, I think the paper is definitely on the upswing. We've been hiring more people in our Washington bureau. We have been hiring back people who used to work for us and left because they were demoralized. So we're seeing familiar names in the paper, people who know Los Angeles, who know California, who are in a position to help bring along younger reporters as well. Um, the question is whether the paper part of newspapers will survive. It's a very expensive process. Printing it up, distributing it in trucks, it may all turn into pixels, but there's always going to be a need for news. And my, the, the story I tell is about our, our Washington bureau where my colleague Paul Houston worked in the late 80s uh, late 70s, excuse me, in the Carter administration when interest rates were so high that farmers were losing their farms and they protested in a tractorcade blocking traffic out of Washington. And people were very angry because they wanted to go home uh, to Arlington or points out. And one woman that Paul reported on got out of her car and started yelling, I don't need you farmers, I get my food at the grocery store. <laughs> well. And the parallel today is people say, I don't need newspapers, I get my news from Facebook and Google. Where the hell do you think Facebook and Google get it? There are no Facebook reporters in Sacramento. Google isn't covering the Pentagon or the counterterrorism. Newspapers, news agencies have reporters there. And for Facebook and Google just to pluck the stuff out of our content and put it on their sites where people will say, okay, now I know. They don't go to the website of the LA Times. They don't give us the clicks. They don't give the New, York, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the clicks that will pay us to pay our reporters. You know, you're downloading music for free. Why not news for free? That model cannot sustain itself. And if you find that the only thing out there, that Thomas Friedman said the, in, the, the world is flat from an economic point of view. My problem with the internet is it is flat. There is no topography on the internet to tell you what's legitimate and what's not. You see these websites that bitch about the mainstream media, but what do they look like? They try to look like mainstream newspapers. They've got gothic type. They call themselves the standard or the examiner as if they were a legitimate news organization. And so they steal the thunder, the legitimate thunder from legitimate news organizations and yet use it to mock and destroy. And I don't think that's very good for democracy. I think it's corrosive and um, it, the way that we're going now, people have a renewed interest in newspapers, a renewed interest in legitimate reported news, but I don't know where that balance will be struck in the long term. I think it's very interesting that I can recall when uh, Mr. Reardon was uh, mayor of the city of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always thought that there was so much news coverage at that time, and I thought some of it was truly uh, hostile. And some of it was really fair, and it was a, a, a true mixture of, uh, of opinion about what you were doing as mayor. It's interesting today that really there's only one or two, maybe three sources of information about the mayor. And it's just staggering that uh, you, you really, I mean, I'm not being critical of the mayor, but you really don't have a clear idea what's going on. And if the LA Times went away, or went through another period of regression, uh, the city would really be 
adrift. And you have seen this too in, in television news. Television news used to have reporters in City Hall and the County Board of Supervisors. They would cover local politics because politics is really civic life. That's your public life. And yet today it's the car chase news. It's they'll cover a crime in Florida before they'll cover what happened at City, City Hall because they're getting the video free from somewhere. Well, news is expensive. News, news is, is really an expensive. Investment. Uh, about 1978, I came here to run a television station in Los Angeles, big television station. And I did the re first research the station had ever done about audience attitudes about news. What was interesting is that the people in the survey, first of all, did not think of themselves as Angelinos. That was not their reference as to where they lived. They identified themselves by their community within Los Angeles. They identified them by their recreational forms. And then they identified them by uh, their work. And we asked the people what they thought about the news from Sacramento. And the audience, or the representatives of the audience, came back and said where? They had absolutely no interest in news from Sacramento. It wasn't a factor. And I did what, what for me, or for the company, was a responsible job. I just took four people out of Sacramento because we were having no impact there at all, and we're not doing anything, it appeared, for our, our audiences. But whatever, that, uh, I think what we should do is say, are there questions for Pat in the audience? How about questions for Van, too? Van doesn't answer questions. Uh. <laughs> I say that facetiously. Yes? On very little sleep, for starters. Um, this, we started my television show, our television show, Life and Times, three months before the riots began, four months before the riots began in 1992. And it began in part to be an exemplar of civil discussion. Because you'll remember we had Ruben Martinez on the left, Hugh Hewitt on the right, and I was the journalist, although I did not sit in the middle because that's a traditional girl seat. I refused to sit in the middle and be like a tennis judge, you know, always going back and forth. But the, to set the example first, the content, important, but how we discuss things was something that in the building of the show became very important. And I also think that each of these media television, radio, podcast, um, and print, can tell the same story in a different way for a different audience. It may need different ways of bringing this viewer or that listener into the same story. And a professional challenge was the fun of doing that, but also understanding that, as Van was saying, a newspaper alone can't reach anybody, everybody. It has trickle down because all the television stations will use newspapers in order to assign big stories if there's a court hearing or something like that. But you need to reach a, a bigger audience with each of the same stories. As for radio, you know, I keep referring to your ears as two of the most intimate orifices in your body. But radio is very mobile. Los Angeles is a mobile place. Podcasting and radio you can take with you virtually anywhere. And so there were all of these stories, one-on-one -on -one interviews, uh, panels with people from the Board of Supervisors, to bring this panoply of news to people who might have no other means or use no other means of accessing it. And so I always thought that was important. Um, even though as a child I was just a reader, I knew that you could spellbind people with those stories one way or another, through the ears, the eyes, um, or holding some paper in your hand. 
And so I think that's one of the challenges I find is so young people have grown up being videotaped themselves. Their parents will have hours and hours and hours of every birthday party you ever had. Being on the other end of that, knowing how to tell stories for listeners or for viewers is a, a skill you have to cultivate. And so I'm hoping that one of the things I've been doing at the Times is teaching young people how to appear on television, how to speak on radio, so that they can be compelling. Because if you're, when you watch television, <coughs> you know this, you're not really <coughs> necessarily listening first to what they're saying. You're making a judgment within a few seconds of what it is you're seeing. And so if someone has a little tick where they keep scratching the corner of their, um, their eyes, that's what you're gonna notice. And you're gonna come away thinking, oh yeah, that's the guy who scratches the corner of his eye. You weren't listening to what he was actually saying. And so training people to do that, I think, is extremely important, to streamline the message, to structure the message so that that message gets across, and in an amiable way, too. Um, and Van is the television veteran, so he, he would know better than I how important that is in, in, in storytelling. I was the least successful anchorman in the history of American television. I did the 5 o'clock news for CBS in Chicago, and according to the rating services, I was an absolute disaster and was fired. So I've always had sort of an interest in, uh, in the conduct of a person on television. Where do you get your news? I mean, if to, oh, on a day-to-day -day basis, where do you get your news? Do you feel well served? But you are a rare creature. Most people are satisfied with 15 minutes. You know, what, what's the KFW sl B slogan? Give us 22 minutes, we'll give you the world. Happens to be the same 22 minutes of news every hour, I guess, but or squeezed into an hour. Is, is there but anybody I, in the room who doesn't read a newspaper every day? Do all of you read a newspaper every day? What a wonderful audience you are. My God. So, yes, ma'am. If, if I, well, I, I'm, I will, will discount television because, well, but, but I'm discounting let, some let of me, television. Let me, let me just say something. That is a very common observation in all the research on news. Everybody wonders why we are not hearing more things about successful people, uh, productive innovation. Uh, happiness here or there, and there's a feeling that the news is overwhelmingly negative and discouraging and unuplifting. So I have actually one minute to address this before they cut off the mics, but I don't think that's true. You look in the business section, you look in the feature section, you see stories about students starting food banks, you see stories about people who build a, a business from their own garages in the ground up. News is the exception. And thankfully, the exception is still what's bad. If we start getting to the tipping point where we have to report good stuff, they actually started a newspaper in Eastern Europe that was only good news and it folded after three days. So anyway, but um, we have about 50 seconds and I want everybody to please thank Van because he was very kind to indulge me and you to indulge me in my uh, ramblings and reminiscences today. Well, it's been a joy being with you. And, and thank all of you for exhibiting a curiosity about journalism and a, uh, and a woman who has been a example of serious, responsible, professional conduct. Thank you. Thanks ever so and much. And Ben's book about the Sunset Strip, it's fabulous. Oh. Go check it out.